welcome back everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started because I'm going to be covering for our friend Phil Stafford, who is a, unfortunately had a heart catheterization on Monday and his doctors have told him to take it easy. He and I did a really fun presentation together last December, actually, uh, about social isolation. And uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present in his absence, and I'm gonna cover some of the ground that I covered. I may skip through a few slides just in the interest of time, uh, but I'll get going on that. So what I wanted to talk about then and wanna talk about now is what are these emerging lessons coming out of COVID-19? And uh, clearly we have major issues of social isolation and the role that the built environment plays in either ameliorating that and connecting us to one another or conversely exacerbating that and isolating us, which is a terrible toll, takes a terrible toll. So here's the good news. We're almost all vaccinated. Ryan just got his yesterday, day before yesterday. Uh, congratulations to Ryan. But then we recognize that there, there's disturbing news about the underlying problems and the inequality of who is getting the vaccine, who is getting health care, who is getting COVID. Uh, the ethnic communities that are, have much higher rates, the elderly, who, are, who the impacts are clearly much higher, and the impacts on uh, social isolation, from social isolation for uh, the elderly in particular. Uh, and this is something that is really uh, a fatal disease. I mean, 13.4% of patients 80 and older are dying compared to those uh, in their 50s, uh, 1.25 and so on. So clearly the, the, we all know the pandemic is hitting uh, seniors very, very hard and it has enforced social isolation and created many other kinds of problems, uh, deteriorating mental and physical health, depression, de decreases in cognitive functioning uh, and so on, many other issues as well. And it's exacerbated the problems that we already have from a, a car dominated, over encapsulated uh, lifestyle. Um, and. Uh, you can see that if, if seniors are not able to drive, uh, that's going to be a problem. They're going to be increasingly isolated. It's, it's hardest on those who cannot drive, uh, it, which not only seniors, but the poor and, and infirm uh, and children and, and then the parents who become taxi drivers and so on. So these are very profound impacts that are preventing uh, especially seniors, but many others from forming these critical social connections uh, within public spaces and the adjoining third places and private places. Uh, and so we have serious structural challenges to address. Uh, we have to do that through policy, but we also have to do that through changes to the strategies and tools we use for planning and design, which of course is what we're sharing here today. And the strategies and tools to build and protect the public spaces that we already have. And the research is demonstrating, as we talked about earlier, that this uh, public space is this essential urban framework for accessing resource, resources and opportunities, social contact, knowledge and exchange, and healthy, healthy and ecological living. Um, and it's uh, confirming the importance of public space for urban resilience. Uh, some of you not probably know the work of Eric Kleinenberg, the sociologist who did the famous study on the uh, Chicago heat wave of 1995. And what he found was the key difference between the neighborhoods where uh, many survived and others that are demographically similar turn out to be the sidewalks, the stores, the restaurants, uh, the community organizations, all this what he calls social infrastructure that brings people into contact with friends and neighbors. So this is not just a, a nice amenity, uh, it's a matter of life and death, literally, in, in many ways. So let me ask the question that we are all thinking about these days, what are the lessons from this teachable moment, you might say, uh, for public space? Uh, and as all of the speakers before me have just noted public space really matters. We miss it when we don't have it, right? We haven't had it for uh, during the pandemic, and there's good reasons why that is the case. And here's another point. Density in the abstract is not the problem uh, in the age of COVID-19. It's the pattern of connectivity. These three examples are exactly the same density. They're about 75 units to the hectare, uh, about 30 units to the acre. Uh, and yet the pattern of connectivity is very different in the tall building where everybody goes into the same elevator lobby and, and into the same uh, you know, uh, centralized uh, entrances and so on, as compared 
compared to the more dispersed uh, townhouse or row house where everybody is you know, able to spread out more, but maybe they're not contacting each other as much, as opposed to the perimeter, perimeter block pattern on the lower right where there's sort of a mix of the two. You can still interact and connect with people, but you're not forced into protection. And I think we need to understand that there are ways to maintain mixed, walkable cities with good quality public space that provides what I would call sociable distancing. This happens to be my daughter and grandkids on the porch of their house there. And you can see that I'm, as I'm walking by, I can connect to them, but I can still stay safe and they can stay safe. So we need to understand this about public space, that it needs to protect us at the same time that it connects us. And that's a fundamental um, a requirement of public space. That's a fundamental requirement of urbanism, I would argue. And it, it, that means it mean, needs to exclude as well as include. We need to be able to control that and modulate that connectivity uh, and do that at a variety of scales, at the scale of the house, at the scale of the neighborhood, at the scale of the city, uh, and so on, that we are, it's, they are um, um, entities that uh, connect one another through this spatial system. And that goes to the, the core point of why we build cities at all, right? Uh, we build to interact with each other, to have access to resources, to create wealth and human development, to shelter and protect, and to fundamentally connect to one another. Uh, but what are we building in our time? I think you all recognize the challenges of that, this fragmented, disconnected, uh, privatized, uh, gated, isolated, uh, et cetera, et cetera, very low quality, car dominated, and so on. And things that seem rational at one scale uh, can become highly irrational and destructive at another. These are some slides that my friend Dick Jackson, who you saw or you, who you will see again today, uh, uh, provided. You know, this idea that y you, you are losing the uh, connectivity in, uh, in many of our systems today because the silos of planning turn out to be the fragmented uh, connectivity of the urban scale. And so I mentioned this earlier that in the first five decades of the 20th century, we're on track to produce more urban fabric than in the last 5,000 years, which is a, a shocking uh, realization. Uh, and this is meant much of what we're building. This is in San Antonio uh, near the airport there. And so you can see that if you compare that kind of environment and the choices that it affords to us, the choice architecture, as the behavioral economists refer to it. That's a very, very different set of choices than say Amsterdam on the right where you can walk, you can bike, you can have access to healthy foods and so on. On the left, you're probably in your car and you're in a hurry and you're gonna drive through and you're gonna uh, consume a lot of packaging and a lot of meat and a lot of other things. It's a, a whole system of behavioral choices and behavioral consumption patterns that are tied up with that. And this is the, the quote that I showed earlier, a new definition of the city as a contact system, a set of interactions and flows. <clears throat> and this goes again to the point that Jane Jacobs made, the great point about uh, <clears throat> the idea of um, the organized complexity, uh, uh, Doug referred to it, others have referred to it uh, recently, that uh, th these are uh, obviously interconnected uh, relationships that we can understand, uh, and this is really the, the core point of that book, and the core point that it all comes down to the lowly sidewalk, as she referred to it, uh, that are the small change from which a city's wealth of public life may grow. And Kevin Lynch talked about that and, and uh, talked about the need for a sound theory of what a good city is, a kind of like a sound germ theory. If we don't have that, we may have all kinds of pseudo-scientific ideas. Uh, and this was a point that Jacobs made that the, uh, in her day, the pseudo-science of planning and architecture uh, seems almost neurotic in its determination to imitate empiric failure and ignore empiric success. And I think we could ask a hard question today of how far we've really come in that. Um, so there is great uh, um, hope, I think, great advancement in other fields, in, in other fields of science, particularly network theory, understanding how patterns of connection work, connective relationships and how they transform over time, uh, rich club networks, which are the nodes of connectivity that can be very powerful, the agglomeration benefits of cities, but also how you need to sort of spread it around and, and connect everybody into the network uh, according to Metcalf's law, the network is more powerful when you do that. 
Uh, the great Herbert Simon, 1962, talked about the architecture of complexity, and he noted that these relationships are nearly decomposable. They're not, it's not a perfect uh, tree. It's an interconnected web network, and there are uh, crossover relationships, which is a point that Christopher Alexander made a few years later in his paper, A City is Not a Tree, that these crossover networks are very, very important, actually, these overlaps, these uh, semi-lattices, as he referred to them, that create this web network pattern pattern uh, that is really the, the, the basis of resilience, the basis of um, redundancy, like the internet is a resilient network because it is interconnected and it's not a simple hierarchy. Um, and then Bruno Latour, who talks about, many of you may know, uh, actor network theory, the idea that the, we are in a web of, of relationships with what he calls actors. And the actors are not just people, they're things, they're, they're institutions, they're places, they're all the things that we, we uh, interact with. Uh, and so we can understand much more about how public spaces work when we see the world through that lens. Uh, and that means, you know, third places, our actors as well, third objects, connecting us into this web network. So we all know what it's like to be in a public park and you see other people, you don't interact with them because that would be too awkward. But if there's a third thing, like the dog, oh, what breed of dog is that? And suddenly you can start a conversation uh, which you wouldn't otherwise start with somebody uh, So because of that web of relationships and that sort of interconnected, uh, almost like rock, paper, scissors relationship that, as Christopher Alexander pointed out, is really the essence of so many relationships in cities. And he talked about at the uh, center of uh, Berkeley there where the, there's a traffic light and a, um, a, a sidewalk and a, a newspaper rack, and they all interact in this web, uh, web network, this rock, paper, scissors fact, uh, um, fashion. Um, so for the next part, I'm, gonna, I'm keeping an eye on the time here, and I'm probably going to skip through some slides, but I want to talk about a little more detail about this structure of web, uh, uh, web relationships uh, uh, or a place network, as you might think of it. Um, and I'll give you an example of how that works in, in a concrete sense. This is a street in London near where I used to live. Um, and you'll notice that there are many different places that people can be out on the street or up in their private spaces or up on the balcony there. Uh, and not only can they be in those places, but they can move from one place to another, but maybe not to from one place to yet another. There's a door or there's a, it's a separate level or whatever, and they can see or maybe not see. They can hear, but maybe not hear if it's a piece of glass and so on. See and not see or not see if it's a bush. And so the interconnected relationship of all these spaces is incredibly complex, actually. The ability to move, see, uh, hear, uh, interact and so on, and all ultimately connected by the sort of um, the framework of public space, the street, as, as Vikas was saying earlier. Um, and so if you think about that as a gradation, uh, as, as David was alluding to, from the most private space, maybe your bedroom, your bathroom, and so on, to your more public spaces out on the, the edge of the uh, house, and then out into the literal public realm, the yard, the garden, the, the, the sidewalk, the street, and so on. And all of these things are uh, part of a continuous web network of spaces, and all of those spaces have room-like qualities. They have edges, they might be literal walls, or they might just be defined edges. They have some kind of a gateway or a membrane that allows things to pass through, but not all things. We can control that, right? We can close a window if it's noisy, or draw a blind if we want privacy, but we still can be connected in some degree, in the degree that we ourselves choose. So we build that capacity into our environment to allow ourselves to control, to uh, open doors and close windows and so on. Uh, and that goes right out into the public realm as well. So we, uh, you know, build a gate or do a, a, a wall or whatever. And again, this is something that we're constantly transforming, not only at the scale of, you know, doors and windows and, and curtains and so on, but also remodeling projects and transforming. And I, I want a window here. I want a, a wall here. And people gradually uh, transform that space, as we can certainly see through the COVID 
pandemic. This is a street in Portland where they have um, taken on some of these transformations that David and others have talked about of, of um, redefining uh, public spaces in a sort of tactical way of uh, uh, you know taking over the public realm. Uh, and maybe it's going to last. Maybe it's not. That's a really interesting question. You know, I, I suspect some of this will last. The parklet phenomenon, which is maybe a bit of a double-edged sword, but on the other hand, you know, the, it's a, it, in a sense, it's a kind of privatization of a parking space, but in another sense, it's a public good because it creates life on the street and, and activity and, and uh, uh, eyes on the street and other sort of uh, public, uh, public goods. And then the need to keep people comfortable regardless of, you know, where they are and what, they're, what time of season it is, uh, whether it's hot or cold or rainy or whatever, and people are doing all these transformations of these spaces, which is quite fascinating. And then if you look at a longer scale of time of let's say five years, I went back to the same place in five years and you can see that there were quite a few remarkable transformations, not only new businesses came along and new signage and colors and banners and stuff, but the articulations of the spaces of the place network. There's new, you see at the bottom, there's new uh, uh, walls up above their fences. They've created terraces up above. They've uh, created a couple of plants at the stoop to sort of define that entrance space. They took away the, the uh, sidewalk cafe. I'm not sure, maybe it was the time of year uh, or whatever, but uh, all of those things are gradually transforming and people themselves as agents are making these changes. So we've got to build that into our environments, that capacity to allow it to evolve because this is what happens over, let's say, a hundred years or a couple of hundred years. You have a place like Venice. Uh, on the left is the cadastral plan uh, in the famous drawing by Muratori, the study that he did, uh, and looking at the exact same place in about 100 years or so, and you see how incredibly intricate and, and uh, evolved it is. Uh, it's a much more sort of uh, complex web network of spaces, and all of those are little bitty changes that people made over the years. They went to the doge and to get permission, and they, they built uh, additions and extensions and, and made uh, real estate agreements with their neighbors and all the rest of it. Uh, and so it's really a, an incredible transformation. And I think that's how we build great cities over time. We build in this capacity. Uh, this is also work by Mustafa bin Hamoush. Some of you may know, showing how some of these really amazingly complex cities form out of these very local agreements between uh, neighbors to create new, new streets or new alleys that open up uh, uh, you know, new property for uh, something else to happen there, whether it's a shop or another set of houses or whatever. Uh, and this evolves and transforms over time. And also in informal settlements, you can see up above there how it's actually self-organizing into a mixed-use area that's quite complex and quite rich. Uh, and you see that is the good side of informal settlements, I would say, that capacity to uh, improve over time. And if we can get that capacity and, and get better quality uh, sanitation and, and public space uh, allocation and other things, uh, transportation that they don't have, then I think we have something very powerful. This is in Medellin where they have done exactly that. They brought in uh, this amazing sort of escalator right in the middle of an informal settlement that's done amazing things to catalyze growth around it. Um, and so when you look at the world this way through these sort of place networks, you will find, I think, I certainly have found that you see uh, different uh, things. You see the world in a much richer way, how these spaces are articulating and transforming uh, and becoming richer over time. Here's in Portland, Oregon, uh, the same thing you can see, again, the sort of place networks and how they evolve over time in places in Italy or many, many parts of the world that are enriching in exactly this way. But Look at what we're doing, though. This is Italy in 1910, and this is Italy in 2010 after the L'Aquila earthquake. You got the public realm bang on to the uh, private realm with none of this articulation between, uh, and quite a deadly zone, I would say, of, of lack of life, as opposed to the street that's so dynamic and rich in, this is in Oslo, this is actually today, but it was built about 1910 or so, and this is what we're building today in Oslo. Um, you know, a 
deadly zone uh, that's, you know, for, from a pedestrian's point of view, that's really only good for the car. Uh, and clearly the pedestrian experience is wanting. So I think we need to recognize the importance of um, what's called biophilia, the human factors, uh, the affinity for natural environments and natural structures, not only just greening our cities, but also thinking about the buildings, because the buildings are the uh, public edge, the edge of the public spaces, and they need to define those public spaces as those room-like spaces that I was talking about earlier, and, and the zones that we create and the, the characteristics of those zones, how they're articulated, how they create those sort of uh, characteristics that we love and we want to be near. And I'll tell you, I've got a paper that's actually in the in the collection of evolving papers that we're going to maybe do a special issue coming out of this conference. I encourage you to have a look at those. Uh, and this is something I've been working with my colleague Nikos Salingaros on, looking at symmetry in the mathematician's sense as a phenomenon that is a co connective relationship, how we have you know, fractal uh, relationships in the natural environment where we've evolved over you know, hundreds of thousands of years uh, to be able to appreciate those and to, to understand those visually. Uh, and to see those in our environment and to, to long for those, to love them, to love these complex patterns of, of uh, symmetrical, not formal left and right symmetry, but deeper symmetries of patterns and translational symmetries, as they're called, uh, relationships between spaces, for example, uh, and the, the idea that it's not just a matter of this hierarchical tree-like structure for a building, let's say, but it's an interconnected web network of spaces that become becomes much richer when you can look across the space and look at your own building, for example, and across a courtyard, which a courtyards are wonderful at doing this. And this is what great cities all have, like Rome and, and many others. You see these incredibly rich spaces, not only in two dimensions, but in three dimensions often. Uh, you'll see those rich patterns as well. Um, and, and so again, if you think about it this way, in terms of connective relationships, that's terribly important. And I think you can begin to recognize also something that Nikos and I have referred to as symmetry deficit disorder, uh, following on our friend Richard Louv's nature deficit disorder, those two are related, that there are actually measurable health impacts from these two environments, and you can guess which one has the more detrimental health impact. And the properties of symmetry that exist in the natural world, not only the left-right symmetry, but rotational and translational and fractal scaling and so on, and these are patterns we know and love and care about and want to be around, the beautiful kaleidoscope patterns, the compound patterns that we we see in, in a, a natural place like uh, um, you know, the Grand Canyon or, or, or Bryce Canyon, uh, wonderful places. And in our own bodies, in human bodies, and, and in the beautiful traditional architecture and beautiful landscapes, this is not just, oh, well, you like that, and you just must be a, a weird person because you like this and I like that. These are, we're hardwired, as the research is showing, to appreciate the structure of human faces, for example, especially human faces that have these deeper symmetries, not only left and right, but rotational and translational and echoes and all the rest of it. Uh, so this goes right back to uh, great Jane Jacobs talking about understanding cities as problems in organized complexity. I'll, I'll close with one note. This is a plug for the book that's out on the book uh, on the table there, where we took a lot of these ideas and built them into uh, a new pattern language. Some of you know Christopher Alexander's uh, pattern language, uh, towns, buildings, and construction. And this is a new pattern language looking at informal settlements and and uh, uh, technology and uh, rapid urbanization and all the other challenges that we face. And Andrew Rudd is part of this project and a number of others who, who are good colleagues. Some of them are here with us. So we have new, you can write new patterns. For example, here's the parklet pattern, right? Uh, here's the sociable distancing pattern. Uh, here's the buildings that are not trees pattern. Uh, so we can really extend those ideas, I think, and become very, very powerful. Um, there was a slide I didn't get into the mix there from Samir Zeki, who said that we really need, our brains need to be around these symmetries uh, and to be in environments where we uh, are, are uh, experiencing beauty he said it is not a luxury. It is the way our brains are wired and our brains crave it. And it is, in fact, a necessity. I think it's a necessity in our cities and in our public spaces. Thank you.
So we're gonna have uh, two short videos from two other colleagues who couldn't be with us here. This has been the year of folks who couldn't be with us, unfortunately. As I said, we're probably a, a month too early for travel. Uh, but um, Mark Neuenheisen, who is from IS uh, Barcelona, IS Global in Barcelona, uh, a um, researcher in public health uh, and the built environment, and Dick Jackson, who is also one of the foremost researchers in public health and the built environment and used to be the head of the CDC uh, Centers for Public, National Center for Public Health. So we'll have those two. I'm speaking to Mark Neuenheisen, who is a research professor at IS Global. Tell us a little about your work. My interest area for research is the relationship between urban and transport planning and health. What I'm trying to do is put in more evidence to support the link between urban and transport planning and health. And for that, I'm using different approaches. I'm just doing more what we call exposure assessment to see how people get around or what, how much green space there is, how much they have contact with, etc. cetera. Uh, I do epidemiological studies to build up new evidence to the relationship between say air pollution and health or active transportation and health. And then also what we're doing quite a bit is doing health impact assessment, giving, looking what is the current scenarios that we have in, in, in cities in terms of air pollution, noise, temperature, um, green space, physical activity, and what kind of changes could we make? How could we build more healthy scenarios? And then you know, model these scenarios and say how much healthier the population would be or how less uh, CO2 emissions there would be as well. I mean, we've been looking at this. So we're trying to build up this evidence um, to support, um, you know, healthier uh, urban living. I mean, uh, particularly from a transport, urban and transport planning perspective. On the other side, we have also a knowledge translation uh, part uh, that I'm directing as well, where we package the information that we get from our scientific research and go, go out to various stakeholders and other disciplines um, to engage them and say from, you know, for example, to urban and transport planners and say from, look at this, how much impact you have on health. Uh, you know, this is what you do is super important to improve health if you do it well. Uh, so think about next time you do something, think about health and I can give you how much you improve the health. I mean, using our tools, I then also work with the education sector. I mean, because, you know, a lot of kids go to school here by car and I said, you know, get out of the car and walk, cycle, use public transport, yep. build up your independence. I mean, but then parents are worried. I mean, it's too dangerous or whatever. So we need to make safe environments. Uh, so both, yeah, I'm working on research, but then also knowledge translation. And I must say, the last few years I'm doing more and more knowledge translation because we have already so much knowledge. We know so much about the relationship yeah. between urban and transport planning and health that it's important to go out to the, the world and talk about it and try to engage people and so other disciplines, but then also politicians uh, and technicians that are working in cities. So that's what we're doing quite a lot as well. Talk. That's one of the mission, uh, real clear missions of the IMCL and always Suzanne and Henry's work was to connect the research to the practice and to yeah. try to actually implement the insights of what is improving human health instead of just continuous moving on and not learning from our mistakes. Um, so we're certainly interested in your views on the current environment slowly, much too slowly coming out of the pandemic and what you think the lessons are at this moment in history. <laughs> Before, I, I think, you know, the, the, the disciplines were a bit separated, but we see now quite a few people that are coming together. And, uh, you know, uh, me as a public health profession can can give the evidence of what is good or bad, but not changed. And so, but I think now within the urban planning uh, and particularly also for transport planning and engineering, there's a much better understanding now that they have a large impact uh, on health. And, you know, these are people are the true public health professionals in a way, I mean, that perhaps not always realizing what the impact actually is. And uh, that's very nice to see. Uh, my perspective is more from European cities in a way. 
um, European cities have been trying to get the cars out of the city center over the years, try to introduce more cycling lanes, more infrastructure for pedestrians. We've seen pedestrianization of the city centers, also putting in more green space because green space, we know it's extremely important for mental health and physical health. So there were already these things going on. And what I now have seen with the pandemic is that this has actually been accelerated. Uh, we see that, uh, you know, cities is city council had to think more about how do we use public space we have all this public space but too often it's being used only by the cars i mean i'm talking about roads and parking and in a way we can use it in a much better way uh, now with the pandemic we need to have distances when people walk around so people need to you know you need to create a bit more public space to walk so it's nice to see that city councils are rethinking how they use public space giving more public space to pedestrians, closing some streets, um, sometimes temporarily, sometimes uh, long term, also putting in uh, cycling lanes so people actually can safely cycle and also starting to think about green space more, I mean, putting that in. So these things are accelerated. And, you know, some of the latest papers that are coming out over the last month, I saw some papers where groups have been looking to see the cities where they put in more uh, infrastructure for cycling. Do people actually cycle more? And you see that the evidence is that people actually cycle more. So I think that's very encouraging that if, you know, if you make infrastructure, if you make space available for, for active transportation, walking and cycling, that people are actually using it. And I think that's extremely important. I don't know exactly what the situation is in the US. What I read about it is also that there is more space being made for outdoor dining, for example, by closing off part of the streets. Uh, part of what happened, yeah. Yeah, some of the, you know, some increase in cycling perhaps. Well, we're learning a lot from uh, Europe as well. And of course, that's another big emphasis of the IMCL is how can we share knowledge with each other across not only disciplines, but borders and learning from other countries and other parts of the world. Um, and that's certainly true in the case of public space and infrastructure and so on. Our colleague Vikas Mehta, who's uh, one of our speakers, met with the vice president, Kamala Harris, uh, talking about the infrastructure, the new infrastructure bill and the importance of the walkability, the ability to walk to the transportation you know, the, if you're going to use public transportation, you have to walk. But walking is also a form of transportation, of course, and cycling yeah, yeah. and so on. So I think we are playing a bit of catch up uh, in some ways um, because we did, you know, we were sort of the first part of the world that really embraced the completely car dominated model of development. Uh, but of course, that's happening everywhere, too. Right. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I mean, I, I think, yes, I think we've got a lot to learn from each other. Uh, but we also see the need to see the limitations of, of some of the uh, models that we have currently, I think. that uh, One of the worries that I have, frankly, uh, is that the pandemic has really exposed the problems with inequality and different levels of income and life chances. Uh, that have become exacerbated in many ways. Yeah, that's right. That's what I've seen as well, that, you know, the ones that are more likely to get COVID, for example, are the poorer. I mean, they're, they're four or five times more likely. I mean, so this kind of inequalities have just been magnified now by the by the pandemic, I think. Um, and But these are also the people that have to go out of their home often. They have to go to their work, so they're more vulnerable. I mean, and I think that's one of the lessons what we learned as well. And um, unfortunately, what we see, I mean, some of the tech companies, I mean, very paid, well, well-paid well jobs, I mean, they're profiting a lot at the moment. Uh, and the, the, the drawback from that is what we say, you know, you get, uh, shopping streets, uh, high streets that are dying out because people do buy online and uh, yeah. do a lot of things online. Right. And I think that's what we're not what we want. I mean, I think what we want is lo uh, lively cities where people can look, see each other. At the end of the day, we're social animals and we like seeing other people. I mean, sometimes we need our own space, but most of the time we like to see others. I mean, and, you know, going out shopping is, is more a kind of a social experience. I mean, that's seeing cool. others and uh, I think that's extremely important and uh, and we need to make sure that we can do that in, in our cities and uh, cities or towns or even villages, I think. I mean, we need to have uh, places where we come together and, um, and 
can see each other and also build up trust because I think one of the things is that as soon as people um, stay at home and don't see other people that they build up a lot of mistrust I think and by actually mixing with other people seeing other people seeing that we're all more or less the same um, helps building up trust I think and um, depolarizes the current situation what we're having well it's very very important and uh, it's the work that we think is very important at the IMCL too so it's uh, delightful um, talking to you many thanks I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Richard J. Jackson, who is Professor Emeritus at the Fielding School of Public Let's try that again. <laughs> I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Richard J. Jackson, who is Professor Emeritus at the Fielding School of Public See, this is why I hate video links. <laughs> Even a pre-recorded video link didn't work in this case. Um, let me check with our tech people and see if we can get it back on. If not, we'll just move on to uh, uh, John Gilderbloom. Just a moment. Okay, we'll, we'll try it one more time um, and see how well this is going to work. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Richard J. Jackson, who is Professor Emeritus at the Fielding School of Public Health at the University of California, Los Angeles, and has served in many leadership positions with the California Health Department as a state health officer. And before that, he was director of the CDC's National Center for Environmental Health. So Dick, you have been a part of the transition or the recognition that the built environment profoundly affects our health and that we have been doing quite a bad job of it. Uh, what is your takeaway from this moment in history? What do you think we need to face up to at this moment? Michael, there are so many lessons and we're in such a pivotal moment in time. And we've got to think about a much smarter way to build the world we are in right now. And in a way, the pandemic, the isolation that it's forced upon us at least in North America and Europe, has, I think, compelled a lot of us to think much more seriously about this. Because I've wanted to visit Carmel, Indiana for a very long time. Mayor Jim Brainerd is a man I admire very, very much. And I would love to see all the mid-sized cities in America looking like uh, Carmel, Indiana as well. And um, so, and David Schwartz is a friend who designed the Palladium there, the architect. And I think this, and I reflected this with a little bit on uh, Suzanne Lennard, which is we got to make places that are rigorous, fossil fuel smart, but are also bring beauty and joy to the human spirit. And I think he, Carmel is a very good model for that. You know, you and I were talking earlier also about the way uh, we need to connect the dots because the dots really are connected. We just need to understand how they're connected. So, for example, livability is connected to a, an, a lifestyle where you can walk and you can get out and, and, find, and meet your friends and, uh, and enjoy uh, local amenities, nearby amenities, healthy food and so on. And that is actually a low carbon lifestyle. And so this idea that we, you know, we think about things in silos, we really should get past that and think about how all these things are joined up. They're part of a healthier and smarter way of living. 
Now, children understand very much what you just said, that they don't see the world as in separated little boxes that have nothing to do with each other. Our educational system is set up that way because they try and get us to specialize and, and not see the connectedness. But um, if you ask a child to do a drawing, it's almost always of a house with windows and some trees and, and um, animals, or perhaps a dog or something else. Um, a child, you don't need to tell a child to exercise. You put them in a green space with attractive, um, active things to do, maybe in a slight bit of risk taking. You don't want them to get hurt, but they're happier when they're in those settings. In America, we've become so car dependent, we've gone from about 60% of kids walking and biking to school to now about 15% of kids walking and biking to school. There are lots of reasons we're looking at the obesity epidemic in the United States. Uh, we eat rather foolishly, but on top of all that, removing physical activity from our lives, exercise, walking is bad for us. Well, you know, one of the things I think we all recognize is that we long for public space. We long to be able to get out and, and see other people, even if we can be socially distanced from them. You know, we can be six feet or wearing a mask or whatever. But I think that, that certainly seems to be a big, big lesson to me. But the other point that you make about the profound way we've you know, rebuilt the world around the automobile and not allowing children to walk or bike to school. Uh, and the other point that you and I were talking about earlier is that there's a profound economic dimension to all of this, that these things all uh, carry costs. Uh, obviously, the cost of health care, the obesity epidemic, but also the cost to municipalities. And this is something I know that Jim Brainerd has been working on and other folks that are part of our conference, recognizing where these costs are going to impact us, impact the taxpayer, right, in the pocketbook, because suddenly we're not creating as prosperous a world or a world that can sustain its prosperity. Um, and that's something that I think we have to get the tools and the uh, economic uh, strategies to be able to recognize these costs and the, and the real benefits to a, a, a smarter, low carbon world. I think we have approached in environmental impact assessment much too narrowly, and we should be doing full scale health impact assessment. In the medical world, if you're given a choice between this medicine or that, or this surgery or radiation therapy, you're always trying to optimize. And yet we build for short-term return on investment and not for the overall general good. And rightfully, we've been very focused in the US on the disenfranchisement, particularly the African-American population and immigrants and people of color. But Amongst the disenfranchised people in our country, profoundly disenfranchised, is the one third of our population that does not drive. Yep. Too young, too old, uh, disability, uh, cost. And so I think we, ought, we, we know how to build places that make life enjoyable, make it easy to be with people that you enjoy being with, to, whether it's you know, talking or clubs or socializing. Um, and eating food much lower on the food chain that is much healthier for us. You know, there's a dimension of this that's quite interesting as well. You may know the work of uh, Eric Kleinenberg, the sociologist who looked at neighborhoods that where survival was higher in the Chicago heat wave. And what he's found, he describes it as social infrastructure, that if you build the neighborhood in a certain kind of way, people are better connected, they're more resilient in disasters, they live healthier lifestyles, they live longer, um, the costs are lower, all of these benefits that come from infrastructure. And I think we have to start thinking, I, it sounds like the Biden administration is thinking this way about infrastructure as something that allows us to live smarter, better, cheaper, healthier, et cetera. What do you think? You can design physical environments that make it easier to connect and care about your neighbors, or you can make it impossible for them to do it. And we've right. done a good job of the latter. Right, right. One of the things we're talking about in this conference is, can we develop a new generation of resources to make these changes possible? Sure. What are your thoughts on that? I think there's some very good news. Um, I spent about three days with Pete Buttigieg, ended up on a PBS show with him. It was very humbling because he was talking stuff I had spent years studying. 
he was explaining it better than I did. I mean, the man is absolutely brilliant. I'm thrilled that he is at the United States Department of Transportation. One thing I worked hard on in California was getting Caltrans, which is a big multi-billion dollar organization with tens of thousands of employees. And one of the things they did was change the performance review for their mid-level managers because the transportation engineers were brought up to think my job is to move people and goods quickly and, and safely. And say, well, actually your job is health. Wait, what do you mean? I don't do health. No, air pollution, um, water pollution, safety. Uh, these are really health issues. And it was put into their performance review. One of the things I'm working very hard on is to get the National Academy of Medicine, it's part of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, to adopt, get this, to adopt decarbonization of the healthcare system as one of their top priorities. 18% of the GDP in the United States is the medical care system. 10% of the American workforce is in the medical care system and almost that much of the carbon footprint. And we all acknowledge that we are not the most important polluters, but we can't be telling other people to clean up their act unless we do it. What you highlight, I think, is critical that, for example, the transportation engineers and the uh, people who have gone to school for many years studying how to build the world that we've been building, the business as usual world, now have to learn new tools, new methods, new standards. It's almost like the whole operating system for growth has to be rewired, really. And I think maybe that's what we at the IMCL are sharing with each other ways to do that, uh, the, the new tools, the new standards, the new you know, manuals, and so on. And it's exciting to see all that. And I know you've been part of developing some of these new, new ways of doing things. Uh, so what do you see on the horizon? What's the most important thing we have to focus on now? But um, I, think, I think I'm very optimistic that our, our future leaders will, they're really there, but we're going to have to figure out how to support them. Yeah, we need to begin to connect the ways that we live and the ways that we enjoy our neighborhoods and our homes to the ways that we're impacting the world. And those are related, as you're saying, as we're both saying. You know, a quick, quick closing comment on this, and it's one of the reasons I valued Suzanne and her books. That, that It was very much about joy. It was about the environments that bring mental and physical and social health. Yeah. And I think that's part of the preciousness of YMCL. Here, here. Thanks to both of those guys, and I know they really wanted to be with us, and uh, they they will be with us. Uh, I, I expect and hope in Paris, uh, and they're they're great people. All the people. Uh, that have appeared by video who wanted to be with us and, and will be in the future, I'm sure. So um, I want to introduce John Gilderbloom, who is a professor of urban and public affairs at the University of Louisville. He's also the director for the Center uh, of the Center uh, for Sustainable Urban Neighborhoods. And he's a, quite a um, Renaissance man. Uh, he's a community organizer, academic author, researcher, uh, international consultant on uh, livable neighborhoods and cities. He's got a couple of books out there that are wonderful about uh, chromatic homes, and uh, he's, he's done some amazing work. So please welcome John Gilderbloom. I'm dressed for success. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got, I got the memo. It said, uh, please, no bow ties. <laughs> anyway, um, it's so nice to be here. I want to thank uh, uh, Michael for, uh, for bringing me here um, and allowing me to talk about the research we're doing, which, is, which I think is very, very exciting. And I have some very important things to talk about, and I think an, a, a, an important contribution as well. Uh, which is pollution, the P word, that um, no one's talking about. We talk about joy and we talk about beauty, and I understand that. And I, I have to tell you, Richard Jackson's one of my heroes. Five years ago, I met with him in Portland at the, the same conference, and we sat at the dinner table, and uh, he told me how important this research I was doing needed to, to come about, because we, he says, we can't prove it. We, the data is, is not good. And we need someone like yourself to go out there 
and show the devastating impact of, of pollution. You can't have new urbanism with a polluted uh, industrial town. Um, and uh, I'll show you how that uh, is killing it. Um, Paul Goodman had a great, 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 great comment. 1959, beat writer, um, and uh, the absurdity of life. And what was interesting about it was, uh, it was a very boring book for me, but he had one great sentence. And sometimes a book is worth one great sentence. And he says, a man has only one life, and if during it he has no great um, community, no great environment, then he has been robbed of a, of a human right irreparably. And um, we need to work on that. And I love that idea that everyone's entitled. Uh, Jane Jacobs also talked about the notion of um, that everyone wants a first-class neighbor. One of her last lectures at Portland State University of all places was nobody wants a B-class uh, neighborhood or C-class neighborhood. Everyone wants a top nice neighborhood with, with amenities that are there. And so often in the, in the work that I do, working with uh, um, poor and minority neighborhoods, they don't have first class neighborhoods. They don't have good water, they don't have good air, they have violence, um, they have bad design, they have multiple um, one way streets, which we've worked on. And Ernest Cortez, um, who literally organized and turned around um, uh, towns in, um, in uh, Texas uh, talked about how in the old days um, in Texas towns, in the minority community, the sewer systems ran down the, 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 uh, the streets, you know, ran, literally ran down the streets. And he says, the first lesson you take in community organizing is respect for the dignity of human beings, which I, you know, that's, that's what we're talking about, respect for the dignity of human beings the right to good air, water, and soil, the right to a safe environment, the right to a healthy environment, the right to affordability and sustainability. Um, I bring this up here because this is a young woman that got international headlines. She died from pollution. She was the coroner um, actually wrote um, for the first time the cause of death was pollution in London. Uh, in the highly polluted uh, neighborhood where she was uh, a victim of. And we, we talk about her, and, but she represents millions of people. It is estimated that nine million people, nine million people die every year, according to Lancet, from pollution in this crazy world. Um, in Louisville, where um, I have lived for 32 years and worked in that West Louisville community where it's all green over there and orange, uh, you can see the, uh, the life expectancy. And believe it or not, if you look closely at that, that the life expectancy um, of some of the neighborhoods is less than Iraq, less than Iraq. We can actually see that up there on, on the scale. Um, Jamaica even has a higher lifespan at 73 years. And so I don't think it's zip codes that shape neighborhoods and health. I think it's pollution. And I will make the case today with lots of data and facts. In fact, we argue that, um, and this is not from John Gilderblum, researcher uh, extraordinaire. This is from the mayor's own office. That the fact is that people in West Louisville comprising of 62,154 people die prematurely from anywhere from 10 to 13 years. And that totals 62,154 people. And in fact, and in fact, what's important about that, that fills up a whole football stadium. That's the devastation. That's how many people you're, you're, you're thinking about. And one of the things we've been doing is uh, we, we got this fantastic data set that was leaked to us from the, from the um, um, the Trump administration, I had a student that went up there, Republican, you know, big eyes and everything like that about doing science. And he was to told to destroy this data, destroy the data. And he found out from his lawyer that if he destroyed this EPA data on cities, that he could go to jail. And so um, he went back to the Trump administration. They said, I don't want to go to jail. And they said, just hide it and make sure that people can't have access to it. 
So he comes to me and he says, Dr. Gilliboom, I know you're an honest guy, a fierce fighter for rights of human beings. This data is, is horrible. And it ranks all the cities. It takes a, a measures of four, four different measures of pollution and it steadily impacts. And when you group them together for a sample of 142 cities in, in, uh, in the United States, ranging from uh, coast to coast, south to north, east to west, you find out that uh, Louisville ranks number two after uh, Mobile, Alabama. And of course, there's the other city, Kokomo, um, Indiana. You know, you want good air? Go there. Has some of the cleanest airs and so on. Something to think about. Um, but anyway, this is some of the research we've been doing. And we were able to uh, publish it in the uh, Lancet as a pre-publication. It's sort of currently going through a review uh, right now. Lancet is one of the great medical journals. Uh, really quickly, what happens to neighborhoods of 62,000 people when you have this stuff in the neighborhood? DuPont, Dow, have you, any of you uh, watched the thing, watched the movie called Dark Waters or the movie Rubber Town? Rubber Town is, actually features me and talks about that. Um, but here's this chemical soup um, and they all merge together. There's 45 companies on One company by itself releases enough greenhouse gases that equals 750,000 cars. And if you multiply 750,000 times 45 chemical factories, we are the epicenter of destroying the environment. That's why you have droughts in the West, that's why you have fires in the West, and the devastation in the summers is just absolutely chilling. And again, um, I, I heard yesterday in the, in the talk, um, was that, you know, we just can't talk about walkability. We gotta talk about the environment and its pollution. And uh, just making a walkable neighborhood isn't good enough. We gotta pay attention to all the neighborhoods that are out there. But here, here's basically the stuff that you're seeing, all concentrated, 75% black, 100% poor. Um, the, the houses are, are devastated by equity issues of uh, worth an average of $35,000. 5,000 of these housing units in a national crisis of housing, 5,000 housing units have been abandoned because people aren't investing in there. These are all the chemical factories and so on. And it just shows you. Well, our recent publications that we've appeared in, and it's very exciting because Harvard Medical School, Primary Care, Journal of Urban Affairs, um, Planazine, Bloomberg, um, Cities, Mag Cities Journal, um, Local Environment, uh, Social Science and Medicine, um, New York Times, uh, what else? Lancet pre-publication. We've been able to, it's a, you know, we, we believe in science. We believe in science. And I was happy enough to be invited to meet with Senator Mark Kelly out in Arizona. And he said, Gilderblum, when I go to Washington, I'm gonna be influenced by science, data, and facts. And you're the guy I'm gonna be depending on in terms of making decisions. We're not gonna do this made-up pseudoscience, which uh, uh, Michael just talked about. The, the real danger is the pseudoscience. So COVID rates, uh, there are extreme differences. I think you understand the uh, formerly, now the fired uh, uh, editor of the um, uh, Journal of American Medical Association recently posed the question, why does New Zealand have such low um, death rates considering COVID-19, why? Well, one of the things that we do know is that uh, the 27 deaths, it's also correlated with it has the cleanest air in the country. You can just look it up on Google and so on. Whereas in Waltham, uh, China, um, has some of the deadliest air in all of China, and I think they underestimate it, but it's 45,000, I'm sorry, 42,000 deaths. Um, the thing about um, Wuhan and the rates is that, um, you know, look at India the outbreaks there. It's one of the most polluted uh, countries out there. Um, one of the things is we've done a study which uh, can, looks at COVID-19 rates. And we've collected all the data from John Hopkins University. We used our EPA data measures of, uh, of pollution. And we looked at our mid-sized cities or semi-isolated. We actually looked at Indianapolis, we looked at Louisville, we looked at St. Louis, we looked at Cincinnati, and so on. And what was interesting, up through August 15th, when we finished up the data collection, the um, 
We found cities or counties that had zero cases or nearly zero cases of COVID-19. We found um, those same cities um, actually had just a few deaths and so on. And, um, but on the other hand, we found cities with up to 1,100 uh, deaths that have been caused by COVID-19, uh, 4,000 uh, cases and so on. And the, again, the correlation was so magnificent and across all the same fancy regression coefficients we did, statistical analysis, working with CIA analysis and analysts and so on. And, and every top researcher we know of, um, the correlation was direct and clear. In every case that we modeled, pollution was the one, number one factor that, that was a super spreader of this disease. Um, we've talked about that and uh, so on. Um, pollution impacts brain functioning. One of the things is uh, why umpires make mistakes and a clever economist is, you know, we can now analyze how many strikes and balls are, done, are called correctly. One of the things this, these economists found out was in the most polluted cities, uh, they made more mistakes, the umpires in, in outdoor stadiums made more mistakes than, say, non-polluted San Francisco, um, cities like that. And um, so I started thinking, I said, well, I wonder how pollution and the chemical factories in Louisville might impact um, educational levels for third and fifth, fifth graders. And we were able to get public data about reading and writing scores and absenteeism and so on. And I was very uh, interested in it um, because my beautiful, <laughs> I don't want to get too emotional here, late wife um, st worked, in, worked in these places unknowingly. I didn't know about pollution in, you know, 30 years ago when, when she started uh, teaching there. But one of the things we discovered is that there's this amazing data set <laughs> we also got leaked to us uh, from a school teacher that they... Uh, that the, in the West Louisville area with the schools, um, the amount of pollution going into the, covering those schools with this, with this crap and chemicals is 12 times higher than the all white East End 15 miles away. And what's interesting about that and what's sad about it is that the scores is that half, over half the kids in schools where there's 75,000 tons of pollution, the EPA actually measures this, 75,000 tons of pollution spread out over them, is causing them that half of them can't read, half of them can't do math, um, high rate of absenteeism, high rate of suspensions, acting you know badly, and then in addition to that, teacher turnover is 20% per year. That it's such a filthy environment and such a dangerous environment. And I think we really have something here, you know. On the other hand, when we looked at the 10 cleanest elementary schools um, with only 2,000 pounds of uh, toxins uh, measured in that area, maybe it's, you know, blow over from, from West Louisville, uh, you find that uh, reading and math scores are, are, are up to 80% and so on. It's working. So location matters, neighborhoods matter, and shape that. Pollution also impacts walkability. One of the things I reminded uh, um, the speaker yesterday uh, was that um, in our studies, of, uh, we took the same 142 cities, uh, mid-sized cities, and we found out that walkability matters. Walkability, just like you heard yesterday, um, you're gonna get higher home prices and higher uh, rent prices as a result. But one thing that intervenes in that walkability score is pollution. People don't wanna walk around in polluted neighborhoods and then you have less people, observers out there looking at the, uh, um, what's going on out there. And so that's a real problem as well. And so one of the things, again, we find the perfect correlation of uh, where there is um, high pollution levels 
it kills neighborhoods. And one of the things I'll be showing you later is there's a much ballyhooed um, development in, in uh, West Louisville, which was called the New Urbanism and Park Duval. And now it's undergoing, uh, despite its great design and everything like that, and how last year or two years ago at CNU, they showed it off as a great example, it's not. It's going through abandonment, foreclosures, people lost their equity and their homes. Terrible. I also wanted to tell you that we've also looked at the uh, Stanford University study of, uh, of lifespan. Uh, this is where I wrote my piece in the New York Times rebutting that uh, the professor, uh, Roz Chetty, great professor in economics at Harvard, uh, dismissed pollution. Absolutely just dismissed it. It's not, it's not, you know, we've looked at the literature. He could have studied it. He could have done the same thing we did, which was put in pollution variables. And indeed, one of the things we found when we look at low-income people on the West Coast versus here on, the, on the, the, the Rust Belt here that goes from Chicago to Louisville, and you can see the lifespan there is much shorter, um, people lose, the, the poor lose about five years of their life. Five years. And that article is being reviewed uh, by a top journal as well. Pretty controversial. People are upset about it and so on. I told you about the pollution impacts brain functioning. We got that down, got that down. Pollution impacts walkability. Oh, and here was the, uh, the Park Duval development that was uh, part of Cisneros' thing. And I, I was part of it, okay? I had no idea that across the street was the chemical factories and people were getting sick and, and so on. And then we started organizing and organizing and letting people know that we got to put pollution chemicals. It's not about just moving them off to a rural site. You know, in, in California, they have strict environmental laws, and that's why, and for example, the wine industry, um, you can solve this problem. We've been able to negotiate with one company which released all the uh, one chemical carrying uh, cancer um, element that goes in the air, one of, I guess, 5,000 cancer-causing chemicals. And through regulation, we're able to get them to stop and put in $3 million worth of environmental protections. We could do the same thing here. But Louisville is open for business. We have a lot of foreign companies coming in here and so forth. These are fancy statistics. But these are my clients. This is not right. Well, one of the things I can tell you that's great about coming up here from Louisville is I haven't had to use my inhaler at all. That's a major test, you know. We are the inhaler um, um, capital of America, you know. You go to Louisville, immediately I start getting wheezing and asthma attacks and, uh, and so on. It actually affects uh, blood pressure, um, dementia um, as well. But we're organizing and organizing and um, we have this slogan here by John Logan, a sociologist, um, and he says, the housing market discriminates, sorts people into different neighborhoods, which in turn shapes residents' lives and deaths. Bluntly put, the neighborhood you live in can literally kill you. Um, this is my gang of people. I want to thank... Uh, the many volunteers uh, who worked with me. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, III has come up and visited us. Uh, we've also worked uh, internationally in uh, other countries, um, some, um, some friendly to us, some unfriendly. But I was really excited that uh, part of our development work we, we did about re renewing, as someone said yesterday again, the best kind of green urbanism is not destroying old buildings, but repurposing them, reworking them, preservation, um, and so on. So um, the great Nelson Mandela uh, on my board was uh, Derek Bach from president uh, of Harvard and uh, the late great um, Don Turner, who asked that the model we did in terms of rebuilding West Louisville and our activism be used. And at the time when uh, Nelson was uh, alive, 
uh, there was two competing interests. The Soviets wanted to build sky-high skyscrapers, which uh, he thought that would be really great, just really 30-story high skyscrapers. And uh, instead, we went there with uh, low-rise, one, one and two-story um, housing units to be built. And Nelson took our, our model and so on, as have other people and so on. I'm a good preservationist. Uh, we believe in it. I actually practice it um, in terms of a company I own where we uh, renovate homes and uh, create affordable housing. Um, one of the things I'm very proud of is that uh, I work with um, a uh, woman, uh, Marilyn Maconian, uh, from Telesis, and um, she cares so much, and she, we work together. She's built um, roughly in 23 different cities uh, new urbanism type home developments, um, 16,000 housing units, $2.6 billion. And um, because of the pollution lobby uh, in Louisville, which is very active, they don't like me saying this stuff. They don't like it being broadcast on YouTube and so on. They have uh, sort of pushed me off the, uh, the sustainable urban neighborhoods and basically wiped out my website clean. And so the good people at Neighborhood Associates slash Telesis has allowed me to set up my shop and they're currently raising money uh, for our research so we can continue doing it. But the website is there, Louisville Sun, louisville.org. You can read more about our research and so on that we're doing. I'm very thankful to Bobby Austin, the president of Neighborhood Associates and again, the CEO of, of Telesis and so on. So um, pollution is the problem. We got to think about that. We need clean air. Um, I think it's been irresponsible that some major medical journals have ignored this type of research and um, it deserves scrutiny. I think it's offensive when people say, and um, say the reason people are dying so soon in West Louisville is because of the culture there, which is so backwards and so offensive and racist as well, that there's something about that culture that causes these problems. It's not. You know, and I said, I said, I stand by the work we've done uh, about that. So we need to be more caring. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. Take a seat. Oh, take a seat. Yeah, we're going to do our a panel now, and I'm going to ask uh, David Brain and Vikas Mehta and Steve Knight to come join us. <laughs> yeah. So we've got one more person coming. Uh, Steve Knight is going to join us, waiting in the wings, as they say. <laughs> Actually, the first question that I got from the Attendify app was for Steve Knight. And uh, Steve, you and I already talked about it. I just relayed it to you. And it was a question about the Huntsville project. And uh, how do you handle the parking for such a, such a large venue? Can you all hear me? Yeah. The answer to that is wah, wah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, there, well, it is sort of a threefold uh, answer. Uh, the first is the mid-city development will have uh, structured parking as part of it. Um, the second, the least sexy part of this is there is a surface lot just across the street uh, to the south and east of the project. And then the third piece of it would be ride sharing. And, uh, and I think that's, that, that's an important point to end on in responding to the question because I think it's important to think of this as a place that it's a destination place. It's more than just going there to go to a show and getting the heck out of there afterwards. But rather, it's somebody could make a day of this. Um, you know, you can go there, like I said earlier, to, to imbibe, have a picnic, and you probably don't want to be driving, <laughs> you know, after, after doing that. So uh, I think it's part, think of it as part of a, it's, it's, it, there's, it, there's connectivity happening here between the amphitheater and what's around it. Uh, and eventually, one would hope that as mid-city evolves and grows and develops that uh, there will be less dependence on the automobile 
to, to get to and from the place. So let me ask a question to all the panelists, uh, which is the question I've been asking everybody pretty much. What do you see as maybe the core emerging lesson or lessons, you know, just cent central ideas uh, emerging from uh, this period of history, the, the pandemic and the, uh, the, rec the reckoning that we're having, starting with you, Vikas. Me? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll just ask everybody briefly to comment on that. So I think I'd, I'd like to see the glass, or I, I see the glass half full. Um, it's, it's amazing for me to see just the agency transfer and people realizing what they can do if they are the only ones really who are now responsible to do it. Whether it's um, walking for health, you know, when your gyms are closed, uh, or running or playing outside, as I showed in some of my slides, uh, or it's finding new and interesting ways to socialize, um, and of course, to take care of communities. So I, I really see that there is a, a kind of a reckoning of um, public space as a very, very different kind of space in American cities. And that's really, really promising. And Steve, what, quick comment on that? Well, I, I think there's positive and negative teachable moments here. Uh, on the positive side, uh, the walking, uh, uh, getting reconnected. Uh, uh, to me, it's been just personally, just kind of shrinking my, my footprint on a daily basis working from home and, and getting reconnected with my neighborhood and just walking every day for an hour. I mean, that was because the gym was closed, I had to walk. That was the primary form of exercise. And reconnecting and, and, and connecting uh, with people and neighborhoods that I just took for granted. Uh, a negative uh, lesson that I've seen is the, is the, is the isolation. Uh, depending too much on Zoom and the telephone, and just being reminded of how important, phys how important physical proximity is and, 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 and capturing all those, those social cues. They're, they're, they're really important. Body language is important to communication. And I've, I've just, I've seen a lot of you know, negative repercussions to that lack of physical connectivity. So, and I think we're all anxious to get reconnected. It's, it's great to be here today. I guess it's my turn. Um, obviously, um, move out of a city that's polluted, move out of a neighborhood that's polluted. Uh, it's deadly. It causes uh, respiratory disease. And one, another factoid that I have is that the CDC actually has another study called 500 Cities, and it measures the uh, neighborhoods in terms of 27 measures of health, in terms of respiratory issues, asthma, heart disease, and so on. And, uh, it was literally 35% higher uh, in, the, in these neighborhoods that I'm talking about where the chemical factories are. The second thing is, is um, that was my doctor's orders. They told, he told me, you know, I came in sick, my blood pressure was up to 185. He said, you've got to get out of Louisville and uh, find a place where better climate. So I moved to Arizona during the pandemic um, and actually moved into a really great Del Webb housing development with uh, two swimming pools, a gym, uh, um, uh, walking paths that are off street. And uh, I, we were just amazed that you get this high quality neighborhood. And of course the issue of that safer, uh, I did too, uh, walked as well. Um, and uh, we got up to five miles. So uh, a day, that's our daily walk. And feeling healthier, lost weight. Um, and I think uh, in terms of rethinking uh, housing, I think in terms of uh, that people don't want to be in, in um, large um, homes uh, or skyscrapers 10 or 12 stories high. Uh, that's, that to me is a skyscraper because they, want, they don't want to share ha hallways, they don't want to share elevators. And uh, in real estate, in terms of movement we're looking at in terms of uh, Phoenix, people are more likely to buy a two or three story um, home than a, than a large 10-story uh, one because they want separate entrances, they want to be able to go in the garage and so on. And of course you all say, oh, the heat's so terrible and everything like that. Well, just get up at six o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock to do your tennis and so on. So those are my recommendations. 
David. The thing that I've, I've been struck by is, is first of all, the, the, the awareness that it's created of the importance of informal social connections. I mean, I think everybody who's had the experience of meeting only on Zoom has really had a, a very clear lesson about the, the importance of conversations in the, in the parking lot after, after a faculty meeting, for example, instead of being, always being on Zoom. In the hallways, um, right? Here. And here, conversations around coffee. That's why I think coffee. it's so important to actually uh, be here. And, yeah. you know, the, the, the researchers who have studied um, remote work, you know, long ago made it very clear that that embodied presence, face-to-face -face interactions are a critical part of any, any work organization's ability to function. Uh, to the point where what, what started to happen was that the, uh, it was the, the higher-ups who had the privilege of going for face-to-face -face meetings when they were trying to save money by having the people lower in the organization only faxing and doing doing video conferencing. So I think, it, I think the first thing is that a real awareness of the importance of those kinds of informal kinds of social contacts, and that includes the importance of public space. And then as we began to reoccupy public space, there is both a, uh, an enormous appreciation that I've seen. And what, as as uh, Michael mentioned, I also play music, and when my band started gigging again, it, you know, people, People would be moved to tears, not by our music, but by just the very fact of being out listening to music live again. But even as we did that, um, the idea of moving back into public space and occupying that shared world, everybody did so with, with a very clear self-conscious awareness of, you know, initially it's risk, but you know, the idea that you have to think about, you know, do we hug or shake hands? Do we? You know, how do we engage with each other? How do we maintain social distance? It, it creates a very clear uh, and a, an awareness that I hope persists of the, of the way that we signal to each other in public space, um, essentially our respect for each other's presence. That, yeah. that, that embodied mutual respect, I think, is, is very f fascinating to watch. And it manifests, and I, I t I've taken a lot of pictures in this facility of the markings for social distancing, the fact that, that every other sink and every other urinal has been sealed off. <laughs> That's just really fascinating to see that, you know, how careful they were to, to build the protocol of, of public engagement into the physical environment, reminding people that uh, they need to be aware of these things. And, and I hope that doesn't go away. I'd like, to, I'd like us to hold on to that. Um, so actually, David, this might be a question for you that just came in over the app. Uh, uh, what would you recommend as the best way to involve the public in major redevelopment projects and or rezoning proposals? And you alluded to, I think we've all been talking to some degree about the ways that we're engaging the public are often dysfunctional. Often there's um, tokenism and and uh, all the rest of it. What would you say, David? And then I'll ask the others. Well, I, th I think the first thing is to to have a very clear understanding of what the kind of landscape of social conflict is before you even start, and not just use a conventional process that involves. You know, the worst thing we do is those public input sessions. You know, citizens shouldn't be treated as data points. They should, they should uh, be treated a little more respectfully for that. The, the thing that we do when, when people stand up and give their two-minute frantic speech in front of the city commission, that's, that's really problematic. But unfortunately, I think what it takes, if you're, you're going to have a major redevelopment project, you need to really think about what it's going to take to, to, to get people to the point where they can consider the ins and outs of the project in a, in a kind of non-NIMBY, non-reactionary sort of way. And sometimes that takes a whole lot of pre-project work. And mm -hmm. I would recommend to any city that they, they work generally on getting citizens involved in things. And citizens don't want to be involved in everything, by the way. That's not, that's not healthy either. There's a, an idea in political science of stealth democracy. You can know, in fact, things are running really well when people feel that they don't need to be involved in every decision. Mm -hmm. And our effort to involve people in every mi minor decision 
can be really counterproductive. So you, you have to be careful about involving people in things that matter, create a, a role for them where they can see that there's a substantive effect of what they do. When they come to the meeting and they have something to say, they can see there's a connection between their presence and the outcome. And you kind of, over time, build up that kind of civic capacity so that every time you have a public meeting, you don't just simply have this, you know, this knee-jerk reaction where people show up to oppose it because they don't know what it is yet, but chances are it's not going to be good, so we're going to stop it. So it's kind of building up that capacity over time is the key thing. Hans? Yeah, I, um, hi. Um, I've been involved in a lot of those community meetings and so on, and it often is um, taking over or uh, abandoned uh, housing development, sometimes 600 units or 500 units. And, uh, and getting the residents to buy in. And um, we've done work in Covington, Kentucky, uh, Newport, Kentucky, and in Louisville, and then also work up in Indiana, uh, uh, Indianapolis actually, and uh, other places there. Anyway, I think one of the things that you argue is jobs. Construction, plumbing, electrical, um, roofing and all that. Uh, when I worked for Andrew Como, um, when he was on Good Behavior, by the way, um, he did not hug me. I don't know why, you know. Anyway, um, his whole thing was how many jobs are created by, uh, it was a good question, by uh, construction. And we don't really talk about that that much, but it's very labor intensive, you know. You can't put a bulldozer into a, into a house. But we calculated that for every million dollars invested, uh, you get 17 jobs created. 17 jobs, that's a lot. And with that, um, who, do, who, do, who do the jobs go to? Uh, well, 82% goes to people with high school or less diplomas. And 30% roughly is uh, minorities. And it's good wages, and it teaches people. And then we did a minority workshop. So that's one of the ways we got the community to buy in, by uh, talking about that and how much. So when you put in $35 million for a new investment, that gets people excited. And we always, I don't, what happened to Mike? Mike, come back. I was gonna compliment Mike. Hurry up, Mike. Um, we do use in our development, new urbanist uh, livability concepts, which I've learned here since going back to 1987 and, uh, and using them, walkability, uh, safety, Jane Jacobs thing about, you know, making it just a safer place and a prouder place. And a lot of times the, the dilemma is, or, is uh, shacks or great houses, you know? And when people sometimes want to keep the public housing as it is, um, again, we've done the measures there. And uh, when they're built in the 1930s, we found out that living there was the equivalent of um, having five packs of cigarettes a day because of the cancerous situations thanks to John Hopkins University uh, telling us that. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things is, you know, you want to improve housing, you want to make housing better. You know, now they have heat, <laughs> now they have uh, air conditioning, now they have a washer and dryer hookup, and it just creates, and, and we create these houses that are just affordable thanks to Section 8 and so forth. So I think a lot of it is um, confronting uh, a lot of the, um, the myths and, uh, and, and, and being, you know, showing the data on what, what can be done and, and again, visualize the, the beauty and the joy of these developments. Any other comments on that? I'll just make a, I'll just make a very small comment on this. So one of the things we found in trying to get community input is to actually be on the same playing field as the community. So yes, you're the expert, you're asking the questions or you're uh, bringing in the prompts, but to try and be at the same level as you think everybody is. And one of the ways that we did was to actually be in the places, again, if possible, uh, with the community, walk with them, don't put them in a room, if possible, again, you cannot do that for every project, but if you can be in the places that you're actually talking about, then you're much, much more at the same playing field and you get much, much richer input because people can relate to their experiences 
and they also do not, we found they stay away from that one person getting on the mic and you know, screaming about a particular problem. It, it became much more rooted and in, in place, whether it was problems or opportunities, and that we found to be very, very rewarding and immediately something that we could make um, decisions upon. Any other comment? A quick thing, and that, that enables you to actually, you, when you're on that level playing field, it enables you to listen first and not always, you know, sort of presuming that you're going to first educate the public. And so I'm going to tell you the stuff you need to know and, and then you'll be able to participate. If you listen first, you actually get... Um, you, get people, you, you ask people to bring their gifts to the table and what they do know, and that, that, that can change the tone of those conversations completely. Yeah, Hans? Just one more side note, too. Uh, I, I always tell my students this, um, that in, at the university, we have a very um, safe environment with safe words and so on, but when you go out to the community, it's much different. And um, I remember the first time I got involved with Marilyn on her development of City, City View Park, and it was a celebration of the city, and we had a community meeting, and um, as a result, after the meeting, I said, Marilyn, we're sunk. Those people called you the worst names ever. They swore at you, they threatened you, and everything like that. <coughs> and she looks at me and she said, hey, no one got hurt, no one got disabled or murdered. We're, we're fine. And she said, that, she said this, she said, they have a right to be angry. They have not been treated well. And promises have been broken and they're angry and so on. And let them express themselves and, and roll with that. Um, and I thought that was a really great lesson uh, and so on. And of course, having a multiracial uh, group of people, um, gay and straight, um, black and white, um, also, and, and, and women as well, just shows, and the, the, the time that we went through and we interviewed people uh, door to door um, with our little sun badges at the University of Louisville, people, um, no one ever got you know, hurt. I mean, the administration says, oh, you can't go in there, the students will get hurt, and no one ever got hurt, or they're all treated with respect and kindness and so on, because we put out ourselves that we're trying to do good. So one of the challenges that I see, or one of the big debates going on these days is of course between the, the so-called YIMBYs and so-called NIMBYs and the idea, I think that one of the ideas that uh, has gained currency in some areas is that we simply need to uh, fight back against the NIMBYs and uh, create more housing, and whether they like it or not, because this is a a need and uh, something that they, they should just sort of get out of the way. I think, I see two problems with that. Number one is that obviously this is a democracy and, and they are citizens and they have a reason to care about their own homes and their own neighborhoods and we should have at least some respect for that right in a democracy. The other thing is that uh, maybe they're right in some ways that they've seen what has happened in far too many cases that it is a degradation of the, the neighborhood, of the environment, of some aspect of their lives. Maybe their motives are not pure. Maybe they're not, you know, uh, as, as interested in, in a, a more just kind of goal. But it seems to me that sort of fighting against them uh, is the wrong way to do it. And it seems to me something that we might think of as, uh, I, I call it Quimby. Uh, I'm from Portland and we have uh, the Quimby is one of the founding fathers is a character in The Simpsons, among other things, because The Simpsons is, uh, Matt Groening lived in Portland for many years. Um, and so Quimby is quality in my backyard. The idea that if we can actually develop, as you were saying, uh, you know, uh, David, civic, uh, participation, civic innovation as a collaborative process. But maybe that takes uh, years or generations even. We took generations to get where we are now. Maybe it's gonna take generations uh, to overcome that as well. What do you guys think of that question? Maybe starting with you, Vikas. Yeah, so I think the, the, the question is really about choices, that we cannot put everybody into a single mold, even if we run the numbers around density and public space quality and efficiency and environmental um, sort of benefits, we cannot really put them, put everybody into a single mold 
of the, this is the way that we can live better and it's economically you know, sort of most efficient, it's environmentally friendly and blah, blah, blah. We cannot. We have to put out choices. So I agree with you, Michael, the, the Quimby, which I think would be a good catch one, uh, where there may be three or four choices, each of them betters the situation where they are. So you take the different playing fields and talk about what is the improvement of this to a better quality of life in that particular context and create that as the option rather than asking groups to jump from where they are into one model or one sort of um, format. I think that's where the reaction becomes uh, completely sort of walled, where people say, that's not the way I want to live my life. That's not the way I see my neighborhood or my community. And I don't want to be any part of that. It's really talking about the benefit of where they are and improving that as a quality. So I think it's a matter of choice where we have to have some choices at hand that are part of that um, Quimby uh, model. So we have about one minute left. Anybody else want to comment on that, a final comment? Steve? Um, yeah, well, it's interesting. I'm, I'm drawing more on my own, I find I'm drawing more on my own uh, sort of personal neighborhood experience than my, own, my professional experience in this conversation right now. And uh, there's a local community activist I've, I've done a lot with in our neighborhood because uh, we've seen a lot of development and a lot of growth and a lot of change. And she, she in essence, invented this model that she calls micro to macro. And I think it's very much building on what you were talking about. It's just, it's meeting people at eye level and just critically listening. I mean, designers, we are really horrible at listening to people. We're great at showing up with ideas and solutions, but we're not particularly good at listening. And, uh, and the kinds of things that we heard when we set up these conversations, they were just so simple. You know, when the cars leave, I just don't want the headlights shining in my, in my front door. Um, you know, I don't want to smell the garbage. You know, could you put it around the corner? Very simple, basic stuff. And uh, yeah, there's other bigger things. Uh, I'm not trying to simplify it, but I think it's just, it's, it's critical listening that, that, that we somebody need said, to remind ourselves Well, of. of course, all politics is local is what uh, Tip O'Neill said, and somebody said, actually, politics almost disappears when you're very local. Uh, Hans, quick final comment. Well, you know, yeah, uh, David and then Hans. Oh. Quick, quick. Sorry. Uh, the, um, to follow up on Vigas's point about choice, you, you need to be able to offer choices, but also offer some scope where, where people can see an opportunity to be part of the deliberation in making the trade-offs between choices. And in that way, you can get to the place where they may not agree with the final decision, but they completely understand it and they see the point of view of the other that might have fed into that decision. So and it doesn't have to be that everything's thrown open to that deliberative process, but you know, creating some scope for a process of deliberation around shared choices um, is a very powerful lesson for people in terms of creating that civic capacity. Hans, final comment. Yeah, I um, also do development and um, I, we work in uh, one of the oldest neighborhoods uh, in Louisville, 100 year old homes, Victorians, 125 years that used to be occupied. But we've had to, um, you know, just I thought it was the right thing to subdivide and, uh, and create sometimes three units, sometimes four units, um, very attractive and everything like that and uh, with good rent and uh, create affordable housing uh, for many people, sometimes students and so on. But I think the neighborhood generally buys into when you're, when you're putting in a basement unit or something for grandma, they understand that, yeah. you know, or when they're, you're, you have a son that just graduated, can't get a job. We know what's at 20% now, 30% of the, uh, young men are still at their homes at, uh, up until age 30. Um, Gentle so, densification, as Patrick Condon calls it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, anyway, but I'm a big believer in investment, and I love the work of Joe Courtright out of uh, Portland, Oregon, The Economist, who says, what's worse than uh, gentrification? No gentrification. And uh, Poverty. it's true. You know, if you don't have investment, you lose the neighborhoods. 
So you need a certain amount of, of investment, creates jobs, creates housing, opportunities, sustainability, and so on. I think we need a Goldilocks urbanism. You know, we talk about, the, we, t we think too much in sort of uh, black and white terms, uh, dualistic terms of gentrification versus poverty. Well, where's the Goldilocks zone, the Goldilocks urbanism where you have maximum diversity? That's the point that Jane Jacobs made. Anyway, thank you very much to the panel. That was great.